Hello, everyone. This is part two of session 23 of Pre Socratics to Augustine, also called History of Philosophy 1. We are now talking about the Stoics, and their immediate interlocutors are the skeptics. We mentioned already that Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, started out in Plato's academy and actually spent a long time there. He was there for at least 20 years. And during that time, Plato's academy turned skeptical. That is in and of itself an interesting movement. When we were reading Plato, we saw that the dialogues kind of differ a little bit. Some of them lay out positive proposals, as we saw in the Republic, the idea that the soul is divided into three parts, or that there are forms and particulars that participate in them, and so on and so forth. But we also saw ideas in the early dialogues that emphasize ongoing inquiry and that emphasize open questions and not yet having the answer. And you can think of the development of Plato's Academy as a kind of negotiation between these two tendencies in Plato. Some of Plato's successors think it is much more important to develop his presumed positive views. Others think that really the innovative and interesting and exciting thing is this emphasis on not putting forward anything as if you knew it, if you don't really know it. And that is in a nutshell where the so-called academic skeptics, the skeptics who develop their ideas in Plato's Academy are coming from. They think that Socrates stands for a kind of commitment to live guided by reason, but as long as reason hasn't yet given us uncontroversial replies to the big questions, we just have to continue to inquire. We cannot just settle on something and say, you know, this is how it is, as if we knew it, if actually we don't. And we have evidence that stoicism and skepticism of this kind, academic skepticism, kind of develop in tandem. They develop in conversation and they become each more sophisticated because the other side is raising strong objections. And that is one of the few instances in the history of philosophy where we can reconstruct positions or ideas genuinely as a conversation. So when you want to know what the Stoics are saying, when you want to know what the academic skeptics are saying, you can't just study them independently. Because at every juncture, you need to know what the other group is saying, because then you see, ah, that is why they come up with this new idea, and so on and so forth. Now, one premise that the skeptics are pretty much kind of adopting without endorsing it from the Stoics is that Everything that is going on in the human mind is a kind of representation of a state of affairs or a representation where something seems so and so. The tree looks far away, the honey smells nice, the cup of tea is green, whatever. And all those kinds of representations, mental states, are called impressions, fantasiae. And even though the skeptics do not have their own philosophy of mind, they, as it were, proceed as if they could just sort of borrow Stoic terminology and they talk with the Stoics about these impressions or appearances, fantasiae. Now, the Stoics introduce two distinctions that are really fundamental. They introduce a lot of distinctions with respect to what kinds of impressions there are, but two are particularly fundamental. One is, between rational and non-rational impressions. And the claim is that all human impressions are rational. Now, that doesn't mean that we are always reasonable or that we always think the right thing, far from it. Rather, it means that all of our impressions have conceptual content. When we see the world, we see trees and colors and so on and so forth in our conceptual terms, we see a green tree or we see a tall tree. And that means that we apply the concepts green or tall or tree when we perceive the world. And that is what it means 
that our impressions are rational, that they are as it were couched in these concepts. But not all of our impressions are sensory. So something like the tree is tall is a sensory impression, an impression that comes from sense perception. But one could also have the impression that the number three is odd. And that is not a sensory impression, that is a non-sensory impression. So the claim is there are rational and non-rational impressions, all human impressions are rational, and then there are sensory and non-sensory impressions. And now comes the big point of contention. Based on these sort of fundamental initial distinctions, the Stoics claim that there are some impressions, and they call them cataleptic. And one English translation, and that is the translation used in the text that we are reading, is cognitive. So that is a term of art. Really, the claim is that those impressions capture or grasp the world as it is. So, for example, you look at a tree and you just see the tree. And suppose you have good viewing conditions, the tree is not far away, you're not tired, you know, no impediments. And it could just seem to you that, well, no one could persuade you that you're not seeing the tree. No one could persuade you that there isn't the tree. And those kinds of impressions, the Stoics say, are cataleptic. They grasp or capture how the world is, and they tell us that they are such cataleptic impressions. They don't just show the object, say the tree that is tall, but they also show that they are cataleptic impressions. And the skeptics simply dispute this. The skeptics say, well, whatever example you come up with, at the end of the day, we can find some way of saying, well, maybe the impression isn't cataleptic to begin with. We will talk a lot more about this for now. And in order to think our way into it, I want you to come up with an example for an impression where you think that simply for you is an impression that counts as cataleptic. And if you feel that you cannot come up with an impression that meets these criteria, then I want you to say one. 